student engagement and outcomes in the campus, restoring the campus. And uh, there's a part for everyone in this campaign. The annual giving program is a critical element of it. We're also working with folks to make outright and planned gifts to build our endowment in those priority areas that I mentioned. So I invite you to learn more about the campaign. We actually have some lovely gold portfolios out front uh, on the table outside. And for those of you joining us online, there's a great website, campaign.depaw.edu. And I invite all of you to explore the video narratives uh, about the campaign there. So with that brief commercial, uh, <laughs> I want to turn to the Alumni College and our speaker and host tonight, Doug Smith, graduate right of the class of 1968. Doug Smith uh, was a successful business executive, uh, CEO of Kraft Foods Canada, but since 2004, he has really dedicated himself to the research and practice of leading and living abundance. And he's done a lot of research on happiness, of course, our topic for this evening. What some of you may not know is that Doug Smith is actually one of the most popular professors at the fall. He teaches a winter term course every year, and it is wildly popular. popular. Has anyone by chance taken the winter term course? Maybe not just in the last recent few years. But uh, registration for winter term courses at DePauw is uh, handled alphabetically. And Doug had this interesting discovery on the first day of class one year. All of his students had last names that began with the letter A. <laughs> <laughs> because his course is so popular. Uh, he has a great book out that I believe is on your chairs. And uh, we're just very fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. I've been very tightly scripted tonight in terms of told where I can stand and where I can't stand because it's, it's very difficult for me because I like to walk around a lot. It's a joy to be here. Uh, we're going to talk about happiness. Um, uh, and I'm going to talk for probably 30, 35 minutes. And I'm going to open it up to questions. So if you've got some questions, start to jot them down and think about it as we go through this. And then maybe I'll come up and share another five minutes uh, toward the end. Um, when, I, when I usually talk about happiness, I usually start with talking about what are we going to talk about and what are we not going to talk about. And what we're not going to talk about is the top of that slide, which is mood. We're not going to talk about always being in a good mood. We're not going to talk about plastering a smile on your face. We're not going to talk about finding some continuous source of pleasure. We're going to talk about something much more foundational, much more fundamental. And what we're going to talk about is at the bottom of the slide in terms of fi finding an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment that can be with you no matter what's going on in your life, even during times of adversity and setback and trauma and transition in your life, you can still have this underlying and predominant sense of well-being uh, and contentment. When I was a kid, I had a Mickey Mouse punching bag. I could punch it. It would always come back up. Hell, I could drop it out of a second floor window. It would go over. It would still come back up. And I think genuinely happy people have that kind of ballast in their life. They can go through a financial loss and bounce back. They can go through a health challenge and bounce back. They can go through a divorce or a broken relationship and bounce back. They keep coming back to an underlying sense of well-being and contentment. They understand that grief and anger, remorse, jealousy, they're all stages. They aren't permanent places of residence. And where people that have genuine joy in their life reside is an underlying and predominant sense of well-being and contentment. And the model that I'm going to use tonight is I believe that people that have that kind of joy in their life have a perspective about three things. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And the first is how they remember the past. Genuinely happy people are at peace with their past. What's ever happened to them in the past, they've learned from it and they've let it go. They don't carry around a whole lot of remorse, a whole lot of anger, a whole lot of grief about the past. Whatever's happened to them, they've, they've learned from it and then they've managed to figure out a way to let it go. The second thing they've got is they've got confidence about the future. They know they can't control the future. But as they look to the future, they say, hey, if I do my part, the universe will do its part. It will always, always, always bring me what I need. Not necessarily what I want, but it will bring me what my need, I need. What I need to focus on is what I need to do to prepare for the future and let the future unfold however it's going to unfold. And if they can do those two things, if they can have peace about the past and they can have confidence about the future, 
then they can live with joy in the present. But I don't know about you, so much of my life was spent agonizing about junk about the past that either I did or somebody else did to me, worrying about whether I'd lose my job or what would happen to my kids or what would happen here. I worried about the future, that I failed to live in the present and really joy, enjoy the opportunities that, that are there in the present. And today what we're going to talk about is a set of skills that I think enable people to have that peace about the past, confidence about the future, and live with joy uh, in the present. So that's the model we're going to use. I'm not going to have a chance to go through all the skills. I'm just going to touch on some of the skills about the past, the future, and, and the present. Are you with me so far? OK. Uh, and I'm, I've got 50 pounds of manure for a five pound sack. Because realize, <laughs> when I teach this at Tapa, I have four hours a day, four days a week for four weeks. So I'm going to try to get this into 30, 35 uh, minutes. But you all are quick. All you Tapa graduates, anyways, are quick. <laughs> Here's the four things I want you to walk away with tonight. If you only walk away with four things, it's this. And the first is everyone and everything, everyone wants to be happy. There are no exceptions to this. If you know somebody who doesn't want to be happy, please see me afterwards because the psychologist at, at DePaul would like to study this person. Every single person wants to be happy. The second thing is it underlies every single decision that we make. Whether we realize it or not, the decisions that we make eventually we think lead to greater happiness. Go to school, don't go to school. Take a job, don't take a job. Have kids, don't have kids. Give money to DePaul, don't give money to DePaul. We fundamentally think that decision is going to bring us greater happiness. That the long, a long series of whys is because it'll make me happy. You can't go any further than that. It's what philosophers call an ungrounded grounder. Everyone and everything. The second thing is, it's worthy of us talking about this subject. A guy by the name of Marty Sullivan came along in 1998 and became head of the American Psychological Association. And every, they, have a, they have the opportunity to choose a theme for that year. And he said what we ought to choose is happiness. Because what we, the field of psychology has historically done, uh, dealt with pathology. It's dealt with illness, obsession, schizophrenia, et cetera. It's dealt with the 20% of the people that feel, suffer some kind of illness. He came along and said, this is great. We've made a lot of progress in that. But 80% of the people doesn't mean that they're living a meaningful, joyful, fulfilling life. We ought to take the field of psychology and apply it to what leads to really joyful, meaningful, fulfilling living. And the whole field of positive psychology has just mushroomed in the last uh, 15 years, since 1998. And there's been tremendous amounts of research. And it comes back unequivocally. If you're happier, you do better in life. You have more friends, closer friends, more enduring relationships, more enduring marriages. People say misery likes company. I think that's probably true. Company does not like misery. People don't want to be around people that are unhappy. If you want to bring people to your cause or your effort or your work or bring people to you, you want to have enduring relations, have this underlying sense of well-being and contempt. You do better in work. I point out to students, if you take the top quartile of students in terms of happiness when they graduate from college and you measure them 30 years later, they're making 50% more. They're making a 50% uh, uh, more money. The question is not whether or not money buys happiness. It's the fact that happiness does buy money. You do better in your career. It just makes common sense because people want to be with, around you and work, work with you. You have better marriages. You have better health. You actually live longer. It is definitely worthy of us talking about and thinking about happiness and uh, how do we live with greater, greater joy. The third thing is it's hard. I think it's easy to be miserable. What's hard is to be happy. What's hard is to be happy when the world seems to be moving against you. And I think it's hard because of the last and probably the most profound thing that I've learned in the last uh, nine years that I've been studying this subject is that it's a skill. We don't think about it as a skill. But people that are genuinely happy practice a set of skills that enable them to give them peace about the past, confidence about the future, and live in the present. And like any set of skills, you might be genetically better or worse than somebody else. But like any set of skills, you can get better at it by focusing on it and thinking about it and, and, uh, and thinking about the skills and working on those skills. Um, there's an expression which is connection and context before content. So I'd like to make a connection with you by sharing. Uh, if any of you haven't read the book, uh, I'd like to share with you just the synopsis of the first four chapters of the book. And I think it'll explain how I got to teaching at uh, DePaul University on this interesting topic. Because if you had told me 10 years ago I was going to be teaching this, I would have said, are you, are you kidding? I just can't believe I'd be doing this. OK, if you're with me. I will start with chapter one. Chapter one is called Sunrise from White Pine Mountain. It's November 2012, and I've come to our vacation home at the north end of Lake George in upstate New York. 
Nobody's there. The tourists have long since left. There's nobody for miles around. I've come there for 10 days of solitude to read, to write, and reflect. My wife is a very understanding woman. <laughs> As I have most mornings, I climb the mountain behind our house. It's called White Vine Mountain. And I've climbed it before sunrise, like I do most mornings. And as I watch the sun rise over the, and I have a heavy coat on and a heavy sweater as the chill of the impending winter overwhelms the warmth of my fading summer memories. As I watch the sun rise over the eastern shores, I am filled with an incredible sense of awe and gratitude for being here. By here, I suppose I mean this particular spot on this particular day. But I realize that gratitude and the awe of just being alive is the overwhelming sensation of my life. It seems like dozens of times a day I stop and I give thanks to God just for the privilege of being alive. I haven't always felt this way. For the vast majority of my life, I feel like I've been a selfish little nerd, a selfish little clod, whining and moaning and complaining that the world will not bend itself to my particular whims and desires. The sun comes out from behind a cloud, and I smile as I contemplate the irony of the events some eight years earlier that have led me to this incredible sense of gratitude. Chapter two. Chapter two is called The Long Ride Home. It's a little more difficult than chapter one, but it has everything to do with the subject of happiness. Have you ever asked a question, and before you've heard the answer, you know you don't want to hear the answer? I'm sitting in a hematologist office at the Mayo Clinic. I've been there as a result of some rather strange blood test results that I got back here in Columbus, and an even stranger MRI. I've been there through two days of testing and probing. They can seem to find nothing wrong. It's 5 o'clock. I'm getting ready to walk out of the hematologist office, and just like in the movies, the phone rings. The doctor picks up the phone, listens for a few minutes, turns to me ever so slowly and says, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have blood cancer. You have a slow developing but an incurable form of blood cancer. That's when I ask the question. I am sure it's the, qu the question that's on anybody's mind at that particular moment and that particular time, but it's a question you really do not want to know the answer to. How long before this illness takes my life? He answers in generalities. This illness goes from not even needing uh, treatment to being very much more aggressive. And I guess I look like I needed more information because he eventually says, I'd say probably five to 10 years, but nobody knows for sure. I leave his office. I'm supposed to spend the night in Minneapolis. The idea of spending a night in a hotel room scares the hell out of me. So I decide to make the 14-hour drive home to Columbus, Ohio. My wife's not sleeping. I'm driving. Cell phones can be wonderful instruments, so we spend the night talking. First, my thinking is really pretty primitive. Make this illness go away. It must be somebody else's. My wife lovingly tries to get me to raise my thinking. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, I share with her a story about when I'm four or five years old in my bedroom in Scotia, New York, and my mother comes in to say their prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord this my soul to take. I ask her what die means. This, too, is one of those questions you don't want to know the answer to. <laughs> she describes it to me. The neighbor's dog had died a few weeks earlier, and that didn't make them any too happy. It doesn't sound like a good thing. I am uncontrollable in terms of, uh, of my fear of this issue. And she walks out of my bedroom. And now, 54 years later, as I drive through the night, I realize I have no better idea of how to deal with my own mortality than I did when I was four or five years old. I get home around 9 o'clock the next morning, walk into the front door. My wife greets me with a smile on her face and tears in her eyes. And I realize I am not alone. Chapter 3. Chapter three is called a blank calendar. Have you ever wanted a blank calendar where you had nothing to do? I was CEO of an organization, and I went to our board, and I said, I, I resigned. I told them I, uh, told them I, I shared with them this, my illness, and I told them I wanted to resign. They asked me to stay on as chairman. This could be the best piece of advice I share with you tonight. If anybody ever, ever asks you to be chairman, take it. From my experience, you do absolutely nothing, and it still sounds good at a cocktail party. <laughs> I take the job as chairman. Now I have a blank calendar, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, but for ad infinitum. I think it's a blessing. It's an incredible curse. Within four weeks, I'm deeply depressed. Not the kind of depressed where you feel a little bit blue. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't make a decision. The idea of paper or plastic at the end of the grocery line scared the hell out of me when I, when I thought about it. I go to Canyon Ranch. I spend some time at Canyon Ranch. I work my way out of the depression with the help of Dr. Mark Laponis, who's there. And when I come back, I realize I am a person who needs something. Whatever, however humble my talents, I need something to occupy my talents. But toward what purpose shall I devote my talents? The final chapter I'll share with you is called 27 Students, 20 Letters, and a New Purpose. Gary Lemon from DePaul called and asked me if I'd be willing to teach a course in leadership during the winter term. 
I thought about it, talked to my wife, uh, Spiky. Phil Phyllis is her name, but I call her Spiky, so that's what you'll we'll have to get used to tonight. So I said, so Spiky and I talked about it, and uh, eventually we decided that uh, I should do this. So I started working on it. Six months into it, Spiky gives me a book called What Happy People Know. I read what happy people know. I said, damn, that's what I teach. All the options for students are going up. All the restrictions have come down. They're lost in terms of what really leads to joyful, meaningful living. So I called Paul. I say, I don't want to teach leadership. I'd like to teach something else. They said, what? I said, happiness. There's silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> I think more out of curiosity than anything else, they let me teach the class. 27 students, four hours a day, four days a week for four weeks. At the end of the four weeks, 20 students walk out. 27 students walk out of the room, and 20 of them hand me personal letters, some of them three and four pages long, expressing their gratitude for the course. Ten of them go to see President Bob Bottoms to say every student at DePauw makes the course. Six months later, I teach at Canyon Ranch, very upscale uh, medical uh, well-being spa in Tucson, Arizona. Now I'm talking to people that are 50, 55. I'm talking to people like you all out here, right? <laughs> talking, I don't change a single story. I don't change anything about it. And the response is really positive again. Now I'm feeling really good. I'm like a peacock. I got my feathers all fluffed up. I realize that I seek approval far more than I really should. And when I get it, I feel good. And when I don't get it, I don't feel good. So I am feeling really good. I go to the airport. I upgrade to first class. I feel I deserve it. <laughs> I, I, get on, I get on the airplane. There's nobody sitting next to me. They can probably see the feathers. I spread out. And just about the time the airplane takes off, this little voice comes. And it says, Doug. And I said, what? says, I guess you fooled them. Huh? What do you mean I fooled them? They loved it. They, did, they liked it okay. But you talked about 13 skills of happiness. How many of them do you practice? Hey, I know a lot about this. I've been teaching this. I've been thinking. I didn't ask if you knew about the skills. I asked if you practiced the skills. I called the uh, a flight attendant over and I asked for a glass of wine, thinking maybe that'll make the voice go away. <laughs> of course, it doesn't. We all know the conscience is a mother-in-law whose visit never, never ends. This bu voice bugs me all the way back to Columbus. And by the time I get back to Columbus, I've written three things on a sheet of paper. One, really understand what are the skills and the things that lead to happiness. Two, practice those skills. And the third is to share that knowledge with as many people as I possibly can. And out of that came the, DePa the, the course of DePaul, which I've now taught for nine years. I'm taking a sabbatical this January for the first time. I'm actually leading a group of uh, 40 CEOs through a week of happiness out in uh, Tucson. So that's going to be an interesting uh, challenge. Uh, but I'll be back teaching again in 2016. Out of that has come the book. And I do this around the country. Um, and I tell them you get me for free. But um, you got to make a meaningful donation to the James Cancer Center or to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And uh, so far, I've raised a million and a half dollars for uh, cancer research. So it's, uh, it's been a joy, and it's, uh, it's a wonderful way to, for me to, to spend my time. Um, all right, here are the 13 skills. I don't have time to go through them uh, tonight in detail. I'm going to just cover a few of them. They're all covered in much more detail in what I used to describe as my best-selling, soon-to-be-published book. <laughs> I, lost, I lost both of those lines because it's now published, and it hasn't made the New York Times best-selling list, but it is selling very well. I'm into a second edition. And uh, what they are is a set of skills that give you peace about the past, a set of skills that give you confidence about the future, and then a set of skills that enable you to live in the present. And in, each, in the book, what I do is I tell a story, I say here's kind of the concept of the idea, and then I share tools in terms of how to practice those different skills. So I'm just going to take you through one as an example, which is the skill of forgiveness, which is probably the most important and the most difficult skills of happiness. And I do it through uh, uh, stories. So I'll start with uh, Sparky and I were married in 1969 in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, uh, we were going to drive from there to Minneapolis, where I had my first job as assistant product manager on Bisquick Baking Mix. You have to start your career someplace. <laughs> so uh, we're going to drive. Now, when I get in the car, I want to get to wherever we're going. Sparky likes to stop and see things. One of the things she's <laughs> always wanted to see is Niagara Falls. So I said, OK, yeah, we'll stop at Niagara Falls. She falls asleep around Rochester. I don't want to wake her up. I keep driving. Eventually, she wakes up. She says, where are we? I said, well, we're about halfway between Erie and Cleveland. I'll save the ensuing conversation. We got just short of Cleveland, and I turned the car around, and I drive four hours back to Niagara Falls. Okay? There is nobody in the parking lot in Niagara Falls. It's absolutely deserted. So we walk down there. I can't understand. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We walk down, and here is what we saw at Niagara Falls. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> there is no water coming over the American side of Niagara Falls. You all may not remember this. How many remember this? In 1969, they diverted all the water over to the Canadian side so they could take all these lousy rocks out from underneath and make it more impressive. They discovered if they took the rocks out, the wall collapses, so they let the water back. But we're looking at a mud hole. Spikey makes a perfectly logical comment. She says, let's go over to the Canadian side. There'll be more water coming over the Canadian side. And that'll be guy said, get in the car. We're going to Minneapolis. And we drove in silence from <laughs> Niagara Falls to Minneapolis. <laughs> now, if you mention the words Niagara Falls to my wife today, 43 years later, she smiles. And in fact, she could smile a couple weeks after. And both of us could laugh about what a jerk I was. And I was a jerk. And we could tell our friends about what a, jer a jerk I was. And I didn't realize it then. I don't think either one of us realized it then. And I truly wish I had. But what we were practicing was the, probably the most important skill of happiness, which is forgiveness. And it is a skill. In fact, it's two separate skills. She was practicing the skill of forgiving somebody else, which is the ability to release the desire for vengeance. If Steve says something nasty to me, OK, I want to strike back in some kind of way. And being able to release that desire for vengeance is an incredibly powerful thing in terms of happiness. Because what you're doing is you're taking crap out of your life and getting rid of it. You're releasing it as opposed to carrying it around with you. Likewise, forgiving yourself is a different skill. It's a skill of self-esteem. I was practicing the skill of self-esteem, which is, hey, I'm worthy of being a jerk, making a mistake. I don't have a, I don't, I don't have a monopoly on jerkdom, jerkdomism or whatever. I can make a mistake, I can learn from it, and I can move on. Both of us were practicing a very important skill. In general, I find that women have a really hard time forgiving themselves and are pretty good at forgiving others. And men are great at forgiving themselves and not so good at forgiving other people. <laughs> There's only four things you can do with stuff from your past. One is you can forget about it. It's great if it happens. Sparky and I are never going to forget about Niagara Falls. It's just part of who we are. The second thing is you can do is you can, you can tell yourself to forget it by repressing it. It always comes back in negative ways. The third thing you can do is you can hold on to it, which was what most of us do in order somehow six months from now, Steve says something, I'll say, well, you remember when you said this to me, I'll use it as a leverage against him. But we hold on to it. And the fourth thing you can do is you can forgive. It's the only voluntary choice you've got that takes junk out of your life. The fact that it re results in greater happiness is simple arithmetic. It's taking negative things out of your life. It's like tide. It's getting the dirt out. The other skill is gratitude, which I don't have time to talk about, which does just the opposite, which brings positive things into your life. It has you focus on more positive things. So it's simple arithmetic how these, uh, how these two things work. One tool on forgiveness is a thing that uh, Sparky and I try to practice, which we call dump the garbage, which is if we do something to the other person or hurt the other person, we try to deal with it in 48 hours. We try to sit down, talk about it or whatever, but somehow we try to resolve it as opposed to carrying it around. And it's, we call it dump the garbage because if we think of it as kind of, oh, Steve says something to me nasty, I do this. I do something nasty to Bob, I put this in here. We carry this junk around with us, and it really does begin to smell after a while. And what we're trying to do is get it out of our life, get the negative things out of our life. And I know a lot of things take much longer than 48 hours to forgive, but you'd be amazed at the number of things you carry around for years and years and years. People will say, I'll never forgive them for doing that. That's what you're just choosing to carry it around with you for years. And years. Uh, we call it dumping the garbage. We try to do it in, uh, in 48 hours. Um, forgiveness and gratitude, two key skills that lead to uh, uh, joy, uh, happiness with the past. The, um, the, the next set of skills I want to share with you are about the future. Um, and uh, I'm going to share with you, uh, I'm going to just summarize all four of these skills as opposed to go into them in detail. But I'm going to tell a story about the family. So I'm going to start. That's me on the right at the graduation ceremony at DePa. That's my wife, Spikey. Phyllis, why don't you stand up so everybody sees you. Thank you for being here tonight, my dear wife. Uh, I walked into French class the first day of my junior year in 1966. I saw a beautiful woman sitting in the front row of room 114 in East College. I think Fran Reem, my French teacher, is actually in, on the internet. Hi, Fran. Fran, thank you for introducing us. I thought maybe she could be my friend, and she could be, would be, has been, and is, and will always be my best friend, my wife of 45 years. So thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Next to her is my youngest son, uh, Greg. He's, uh, uh, he's, uh, he has his own consulting business. He lives in Philadelphia. He's just gotten engaged to a beautiful, wonderful woman. Recently, Nicole, who also lives in Philadelphia. He's a graduate of Middlebury and Dartmouth Business School. And then the last person on my left is my oldest, our oldest son, 
uh, Gordon, who's 43, and I want to share a little story about uh, Gordon when he was born. This is uh, Gordy and me. I think he looks a lot like me. He dresses better than me, obviously. Um, uh, but I think he looks a little bit. When, when he was real young, he had blonde hair. It used to be Sparky's hair on Doug's body. Now it's Doug's hair on Doug's body. Um, but I want to share a story about uh, uh, Gordon's birth. Um, after the summer in Minneapolis, I finished at, at business school at Dartmouth. Uh, Phyllis taught at White River Junction, Vermont. We moved to uh, New Canaan, Connecticut, because I had a job at General Foods on Tang Instant Breakfast Drink, the one that went to the moon. Um, and uh, 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 in November, we discovered that uh, Sparky was pregnant. She did everything you should do to have a perfectly normal child. She ate well. She didn't drink. She didn't smoke. She exercised appropriately. We both went to Lamaze classes. Uh, she did everything you could have to do to have a perfectly normal child. And on, January, on July 9th, 1971, we went to the see the movie Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman and Faye Dunaway. We came home. Phyllis didn't feel very well. Around uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, she definitely didn't feel well. We called the doctor. He had us come into the hospital. He misdiagnosed his placenta separata and uh, takes our son Gordon in an emergency cesarean, and Gordon was born early. Now, he wasn't ready to be born. His lungs weren't fully developed, and it ended up leaving our son uh, Gordon uh, mentally handicapped. Now, for years and years, I agonized about Gordon's future. Will he ever be able to walk until he walk? Will he be able to talk until he talk? Will he be able to go to normal school? Will he ever be able to hold down a job? Will he ever live alone? I agonized about Gordon's future. And what I really agonized about was my future and how it was going to affect me. And sometime in Gordy's mid-teenage years, I started to gradually look at Gordy differently. And I realized what he lacked in IQ, he more than made up in EQ. I've never known a, a more happier person. There's no, nothing I'm doing around the house where he doesn't say, I'll help you, Dad. He is just a positive joy to live with. He has worked at Kroger now uh, 18 years as a bagger on Henderson Road. Maybe some of you uh, recognize him. Uh, he's been there 18 years. Uh, he's just uh, an incredible joy to uh, to Sparky, to me, and to his uh, younger brother, um, Greg. But what I needed as I looked to the future with regard to Gordon was four things. I need, when I call him FOFO, faith, optimism, flexibility, and openness. Faith is exceedingly important to looking to the future. It's a conviction that stands on its own without evidence. It's feeling hopeful about the future and positive about the future. You can develop it all kinds of different ways. But if you don't have faith, your imagination will run through all kinds of negative scenarios and will drive you absolutely nuts. Imagination without faith is a really cool master. The second thing you need is optimism. Optimism is a very close cousin to, uh, to faith. It's seeing things in a positive light as opposed to a dismal light. People say, I'm pessimistic, and therefore I'm better able to deal with setbacks. I don't buy it. You do better in dealing with setbacks if you're, if you're optimistic. And here's why. If you're optimistic and you have a setback, you think it is temporary, it's specific, and it's controllable. If I'm a student and I fail an exam and I'm thinking positively, I'm thinking optimistically, I'm more likely to think, you know, I shouldn't have gone to the party the night before. I got a history test next week. I'll study harder for it. I'll do just fine. I made the setback temporary. I made it specific, and I made it controllable. When you're pessimistic, you make a setback permanent, pervasive, and uncontrollable. You're much more likely, if you're thinking pessimistically and you fail an exam, to think, oh, I am so stupid. What did I just do? I made it permanent, I made it pervasive, and something I can do absolutely nothing about. Positiveness, optimism is essential. It correlates with happiness almost one to one. Eisenhower said it well, I never met a pessimistic a general who ever won a battle. The other two things you need is flexibility and openness. And let me just describe these real quickly. I think as we look to the future, one of the things that really gets us into trouble is our fixed notion of how the future is going to unfold and our inability to, to, to accept the merry diversions that the universe is going to invariably take. When we look to the future, we're here. I want to go there. We see one pathway forward. And it's great that we see a pathway forward because it causes us to act in a particular way that will bring it about. The issue is we only see one pathway. And the truth is there's a million pathways that will take us from here to there. And the step, second we step into the future, it's probably not going to unfold as we anticipated. And so we get nerfed off course a little bit. And we're all upset because we say, hey, I did my part. What's going on? And what we really need to realize is there's a million ways that I can go from here to there. We also need the openness of accepting that we may never, ever end up exactly there. We may end up over here, over there, over there, and that may be just fine. If I was still hung up on Gordon being the son that I anticipated before he was born, 
I would miss so much joy that he has to offer to our family. He is an incredible joy in our life because I think I've become open in terms of realizing that we're in a different place than where we originally started. There's an innocence about Gordy, which I absolutely love. He and I walk, if he's not working at Kroger, he and I walk together most mornings. And uh, several years ago, we're walking, and this really attractive woman comes out of her house, and she says, hi, Gordon, how are you? And he says, hi, Mrs. Glutz, how are you? And we walked on about another 40 or 50 yards, and Gordy leans over to me and says, I bagged Mrs. Glutz. <laughs> I said, I said, excuse me? He said, I bagged Mrs. Glutz at Kroger. I said, oh, you bagged. I just, the, the, all the, the negative connotations, the sexist connotations that he marked, just, I mean, I just was roaring inside for, for, for uh, 45 minutes or, or an hour about uh, our son, uh, Gordon. I realized I forgot to share something with you at the, at the end of the four chapters of the book. I wanted to share with you where my illness is because I don't want you to worry about my illness. I've had the illness now for 10 years. I have had incredible response to a drug called rituximab. Um, and I've been infused with it 56 times. Many people only can get infused with it 10 or 12 times. Uh, it's kind of run its course, and eight days ago, I actually started a new trial of a new drug. I'm the 44th person to take it at the uh, James Cancer Center, and it's shown remarkable progress with a number of uh, different people in the trial study. So my hope is that I'm here 20 years from now. They're wheeling me in, and uh, Don's in the back of the room. I want to say, Shani, and be in the back of the room. So I, uh, I, uh, I don't want you to worry about my illness. I'll figure out a way to deal with this uh, one way or the other. So, uh, and by the way, I am absolutely blessed. If you had to have my illness, uh, you know that this is, you, you ought to either be here or in Houston, Texas. And in fact, in the last five years, it's really become you ought to be in Columbus, Ohio. It's an incredible hematology group that they have at the James uh, Cancer Center. Okay, are you all with me so far? All right, we're going to now talk about the present. Uh, and I can't cover all these skills. I'm just, the first one is doing now what I'm doing now. And I bet you all have the same issue that I do, that you like to multitask. You like to do 20 different things at once. Happiness is found in the present. You have to be present to find it. If you're doing 20 different things, you aren't going to be finding happiness. Um, uh, I, when I uh, was at General Foods, a woman a long time ago came to me and she realized that I always did these things. When I was home, I was doing 20 different things at once. She says, Doug, I want to give you a concept. This is a great concept to help you be in the present. She called it thresholds. And she, I, she said, I said, huh? She said, look, tonight when you go home, you drive the car in the garage, you park the car in the garage, I want you to think of every doorway you pass through as a threshold. So when you walk into the house, you pass through the doorway from the garage into the house, I want you to focus on, one, so on that side of the threshold, not the traffic that you had to deal with, not the crap that's going on at the office. I want you to focus on what's going on at home. I said, well, that's, that's all right, but I gotta, sometimes I have to do office work at home. She said, that's OK. Pass through another threshold. You have an office at home, don't you? I said, yeah. She said, pass through the office. People will know that when you're in that office, when you pass through that threshold, you need to focus on that. What I don't want you to do is sit there and watch TV, do your office work, read the paper, talk to your wife, talk to your kids. I don't want you to do 20 different things at once. I want you to focus on one thing at a time. It's a wonderful concept to get you to focus on doing now what you're doing now. And this is one of the, I really, really struggle with this concept. Um, I have a professor that helps me out when I teach this at DePauw. His name is Professor Norton. He's from Le Chien University in uh, Canada, and he is incredible. He lives 100% in the present. He doesn't agonize about the past. He doesn't worry about the future. He lives 100% in the present. I say, students, I'm going to bring in uh, Professor Norton. Please give him the welcome that he's due. Are you all ready? They say, yeah. I walk out of the room, and in I walk with Professor Norton. <laughs> Professor Norton is my son's dog, and he just passed away this past year, but he, uh, and he comes in with glasses on, and he's got a bow tie, and he sits up in the front of the room, and we talk about dogs and their incredible capability to live 100% in the present. They don't worry about the fact that they pooped on the rug yesterday. They don't worry about whether they'll get to play with their friends tomorrow. The only thing they can do, by the way, is nexting. You think when they get home and he's done something on the rug that he's, that he's feeling remorse when you walk in the door. He's doing what's called nexting, which is, ooh, I understand the next thing that's going to happen is I'm going to get slapped with a newspaper. That's as far as he can go. If you ask, him, if you ask a dog, you know, what are you doing? I'm getting my ears scratched, my favorite thing. Oh, I'm going for a walk. It's my favorite thing. I'm having my milk bone. Oh, my favorite thing. He is one. 100% in the present. If you ask him what time it is, if you ask Professor Norton what time it is, he says, hey, don't you get it? It's now. It's now. It's now. He lives 100% in the present. Now, the wonderful thing about us is we've got this ability to learn from the past 
and we've got this ability to prepare for the future. And unfortunately, what we do is we misuse it terribly by agonizing about all kinds of stuff about the past that we should have left, let go years ago. And we worry about things about the future that we really shouldn't be worried about, but really it's just preparing for and letting the future unfold however it will. Professor Norton, the students sometimes, oftentimes, get emails from Professor Norton, too. So. Uh, <laughs> He's wonderful. I, I am now going to talk about, I just want to talk about two other skills in the present, and then I think I'll, uh, 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 th actually three. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you for questions. But I want to do this by using a, uh, a film clip from the movie Castaway. Did anybody watch the, how, how many people here saw the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks and uh, Helen Hunt? Uh, there's a number of props in the movie which have great meaning in the movie. There's three that I want to talk about tonight, and I'm going to show you a two and a half minute uh, short for those of you that haven't uh, seen the movie, and then I want you to tell me what the props are in the movie that are so essential to his. Uh Okay, what were the three major props in the movie? Wilson. Wilson, yes, excellent, excellent. <laughs> What's that? The watch, yes, excellent. What else? The FedEx box, excellent. You guys are good. Okay, FedEx box, Wilson, the watch. Uh, let me talk about it. the FedEx box. You remember he's a FedEx employee. All these boxes wash up on the beach, and he opens them all up, and he gets to the last package, and he starts to open it up, and he stops, and he sets it aside. For five years, he doesn't open the package. And he, and he, and he takes it, and he fact, if he delivers it. Because remember, he goes back. Helen Hunt's married some other doofus, so he can't go back to her. So he delivers the package. And it's like the start of a new life, because he meets this woman when he delivers the package. But I think the package represents purpose. Damn it all, I'm a FedEx employee. I'm going to find a way to get off this island. I'm personally going to deliver this package. Wilson is a soccer ball that uh, he creates a face on. Um, and uh, it becomes his best friend. He talks to Wilson over and over again. He shares all the stories with him and so forth. And Wilson, you remember he takes the FedEx box and he takes Wilson and he's on the raft about three weeks and Wilson drifts off the raft and he has to make a decision, do I swim after Wilson or do I stay with the raft? And he's really, really torn. And he eventually lets Wilson drift away and he's finished. He just gives up. And it represents, I believe, the importance of relationships in life. Figure those two things out. Have a meaningful purpose in life. Figure out how to have loving, enduring, healthy relationships, and you're 10 times more likely to be, to be happy. Let's start with purpose. Freud came along and said, man's basic search is for pleasure. 
Adler comes along a number of years later and says, no, 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 man's basic search is for power. Viktor Frankl survives the concentration camps, comes out of it. He, one out of 28 people survived the concentration camp. He said the people that survived had something yet they wanted to do in their life. He said man's basic search is for purpose and meaning. If he figures that out, everything else seems to go in place. The other is the importance of relationships in terms of having successful, enduring relationships with others. Now, when you talk about these things, and I talk to students, I talk about, OK, purpose is like underwear. You don't want to be caught without it. And so what I try to do is help them identify a purpose. And I talk about it's three circles. One is, what do you love doing? What are, you, what are you skilled at? And what does the world need? And if you put those three things together and you figure out where the bullseye is of those three things, you, you will, in fact, be happy. When I was in college, I played soccer. I loved to play soccer. The world needs great soccer players. I wasn't very good. They, were, they couldn't find the intersection. Today, I love the subject of happiness. And I think the subject of happiness is exceedingly important to this world because I think we're so misdirected in terms of what leads to happiness. And I think I'm pretty good about telling stories and sharing stuff with people. So take those three circles and right in the bullseye of it is the work that I do in terms of uh, teaching uh, happiness. Figure these two things out, meaningful purpose and have successful relationships. Now, most of you all in this room don't have the issue of finding purpose. Either There's two issues. One is, how do I balance this or how do I integrate this with this? Because I don't know about you. I traded this off for this time and again. I traded off relationships for purpose. And I think most of us here are goal-oriented people. We like to check things off, ship a product, finish a proposal, get, hire a new employee, finish the annual plan, whatever it is. We like doing things you can check off. This, we think, takes care of itself until it doesn't. And so we devote our time to this as opposed to this. And what we need to do is figure out how to integrate these two things so what we have here benefits here and what we have here benefits there. It's a, it's a, a matter of uh, integrating the two. And finally, as you, as you get uh, later in life, uh, it's a transition. It's, it's, I think I faced this when I stopped working as CEO. I need a transition of what it is that I'm going to do from uh, going forward from there. Purpose and relationships. Uh, the book spends a fair amount of time on these two things in terms of, of uh, integrating purpose uh, and uh, relationships. When my uh, youngest son, was, uh, Greg, was uh, eight years old, I came home. And uh, he said, uh, we're having dinner that night. And Greg said, Dad, I think we need a suggestion box. And I said, OK. So I came home the next night, and there was a suggestion box in the hallway, all decorated and stuff. And, stuff. and it, we could sit down for dinner, and Greg goes, I think there's a suggestion in the suggestion box. <laughs> so I said, OK. So we go out, and, and Sparky and I open it up. And in the suggestion box is this, which has been on my near, mirror now for uh, 25 years. I wish Dad had more time to play. Now, could you have a clearer sign? Hey, Stupo, you ought to spend a little more time at home. And when you are home, you ought to be home as opposed to worrying about everything else. As still, I traded off uh, relationships um, for, for purpose in my life. Figuring out how to integrate these two things, how to have meaningful, joyful purpose that you're engaged in, and have, how to have healthy, enduring relationships is a critical aspect of happiness. You all did mention one other. Um, and it's the last thing I'll share uh, before I take questions. Uh, you all shared one other prop, which was the, uh, was the watch. Um, and I think the watch, uh, which, which uh, Helen Hunt had given it to him, and he, and he keeps the watch, and he takes that with him as well. And I think the watch represents love. And your life is either driven by fear or it's inspired by love. And you can be very successful by most measures being driven by fear. And there's two major fears. One is I won't have enough. And the other is I won't be enough. And those two fears drove me for years and years and years. I won't be enough, and I won't have enough. And if you get to a different place, which is if you love what you do, you love the people you work with, and you try to build and cooperate as opposed to always being in competition with other people, your life, I think, will be even more successful, and you'll be much more joyful. I think love is the foundation of happiness. Happiness really is a life of love, and it's a love of life. Um, I'd like to take a break and just see if you've got questions. Do we have time to take like 10 minutes of questions and, and uh, do that? Uh, OK, uh, we're open both online as well as uh, here. Who's got something they want to ask? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you know, we all have siblings, colleagues, or friends that are unhappy. Right. And as a friend of these people, what would you suggest as ways to connect with them and help them to? 
Um, I don't think there's anything you can do. Um, I think what you can do is uh, change your own life and enhance your own happiness. And I think that's about all you can do. It's because um, I think people don't mind change what they don't look like is being changed. And I think oftentimes we try to cheer somebody up or do something. I think oftentimes if somebody's really having a hard time, you can listen. I think you can really listen to them. But I don't think you can really coach them in this. I think this is something that sort of comes to people. I, I, teach, I taught at Canyon Ranch uh, last fall. And this woman comes up, and she's got her two sons with her and her daughter. And she says, I've got to get my son, husband to come because he's really unhappy. And I said, hey, don't force him to come. You don't really. And the kids are nodding their head about how unhappy he is. I teach the second session. She comes up and says the same thing. The third night, she drags her husband. Her husband's, I can tell he's not buying this. You know? And afterwards, they all come up afterwards, and we're talking and so forth. And he says, I'm happy enough already. And so I thought maybe I could generate a little conversation because you're not just happy for yourself. I do think you're happy for other people because you have an effect on other people. I said, well, happy enough for who? He says, happy enough for whom? I said, oh, oh, you're right, you're right. And I realized there's nothing I could do. You know, it's just, I, I, think, I think there's not much you can do other than slip in my book and, uh, <laughs> and uh, change your own you know, perspective or increase your own happiness perhaps, yeah. Thanks. Other thoughts? Yes, please. Thank you. When life happens, yes. Made out of plans, but life hits you anyway. Do you have an exercise for the moment, a mantra, a little oh. place that refocuses your, your plans? Yeah. Um, I, what I think about is. Uh, uh, Could you repeat the question? Oh. Yes, the question is, do you have a mantra or something when life hands you something that you didn't expect? How do you go about that? What do you, what do, you do it, approach it? There's an old Sufi tale about a guy who's a, a, a peasant that sells all of his belonging and buys a, a beautiful stallion. And all of his neighbors come over and say, oh, what great news. He says, good news, bad news, who knows? That night, the stallion runs away. All the neighbors come over and say, oh, what terrible news, the stallion ran away. He says, good news, bad news, who knows? A week later, the stallion comes back with 12 mares. Okay? He goes through this, and the son tries to break him and falls off and breaks his leg. All, this, all the people go off to battle. His son is about the only one that's not killed, etc. It goes back and forth. You really don't know what happens to you, whether it's good news or bad news. I am an expert on blood tests. I get my blood tested every two weeks. I go, and I used to go, and I go, damn, look at this. Platelets are down. I can't believe it. Now I sort of look at it, and I say, who knows if it's good news or bad news? Maybe the fact that it deteriorates faster means I'll move to a stem cell transplant, and when you're younger, you do better with a stem cell transplant. Maybe it's good news as opposed to bad news. I don't know. What I just try to do is accept it. I say good news, bad news, and I just try to accept it. Now, it's really hard. I mean, <laughs> when I get bad news, it's still tough for me. But I'm trying to say good news, bad news. Who knows? I'm just going to accept what it is, and what can I do, where can I go from here? Um, there's another thing. I have got the PAL system, which is plan, act, learn. And when I try to stay on that, I try to plan, I try to act, I try to learn from whatever the result is, as opposed to moving to Pity City or you know, going someplace else. I try to stay on that thing. OK, what am I going to learn from this? Where do I go from there? And I think that's described in the book as well. Thanks. Nice question. Yes, please. Yes, in the back. Yeah. Emotionality because a lot of us have with masks. Right. Working out, yeah. Not looking at your phone while you're watching. <laughs> yeah. I I I think you're so right. It's so much more difficult today than it was 20 years ago. Technology not only does things for us, it does things to us. And what it's doing to us in many ways is very uh, distracting and very hurtful. I think. Um, one of the we talked about this in our class one one year and. Uh, the students uh, next day came in and they said, hey, we all went out to dinner last night. Eight of them went out to dinner. And they said, we, we, uh, we did what we called a phone stack. And I said, what's a phone stack? And they said, they put their phones in the center of the table. They stacked them up in the center of the table. And if you reached for your phone, you had to reach for the check. And she said it was the, <laughs> she said it was the first time that they'd gone to dinner and all of them had been present, listening to one another, present with one another, and sharing with one another, as opposed to one being on a texting, one being on. And she said it was driving her crazy because the phone would start to vibrate and they'd want to reach for it, but they didn't. And she said it was such a joyous evening. I mean, they just, they, they, that's what they practiced from then on. So I think, I think um, 
for instance, we don't have a TV in our bedroom anymore. We don't have a TV. We don't have a TV near the dining room table. When we're at the dining room table, we try to eat and focus on family. We're in the bedroom. It's for relaxation, rest. We don't take uh, laptops in there. We don't take our cell phones in there. Uh, we just try to think about what it is we're doing at the time and trying to be there. I'm, I'm not the best person at this, as, as Sparky will tell you. I, I suffer from this one a lot in that I'm always trying to do too many things at once. I've got about, about four or five, three or four minutes just to wrap up. Shall I do that or do you have more questions? Or do we have time? Do we have time to take a more? Please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned faith. Yes. Faith means different things to different people. But if yeah. you're a person of religion, faith is a huge source of joy it is. and happiness. Yes. Do you address that? I do. Uh, it's, uh, I've raised, I'm raised a Christian, OK? And I think I'm a, I am a Christian. Um, but I teach students that are atheist, agnostic, Hindu, a Buddhist. I mean, it's a, and the book is, that, is structured that way as well. Uh, religious people in general are, are slightly happier than non-religious people. Spiritual people are actually happier than non-spiritual people. You can get there in all kinds of different ways. It's interesting. Religious people are happier, but if you believe in the devil, you're less happy than most people. So it's, there's a, there's a, I think there's, there's, there's all kinds of different. It's not, it's complex. It's not as easy as if you're religious, you're going to be wonderfully happy. Um, uh, and I think there's all kinds of developed faith. It can be faith of, of an organized religion. It can be spirituality. It can be just, I think what it really is is sorting through some very difficult questions about life, about uh, what's the meaning of it, uh, death, life, what's, you know, how, what's important in life, what are the principles that you live by, and so forth. And I think if you sort those things out, you're probably much more likely to be, be happy. Thanks. Other thoughts? Yes, in the back of the room. Thank you. Yeah, I did. My, both my parents are DePaul graduates, as are my grandparents. I was number 37 in my family to go to DePaul University, extended family. Uh, all I had to do was walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, uh, and um, uh, I was, my dad worked for General Electric. My mom uh, was uh, very active in our church. And uh, we moved around a lot. And uh, uh, I was raised as a Christian. And I think they did an excellent job in terms of raising all four of us, because all four of us uh, kids of uh, one time or another have been We've been successful in life by definitions of leading healthy, uh, having healthy relationships and a healthy life. Thanks. Um, I want to leave you with the last chapter of the book. And uh, I'll leave you there because I think we're about out of time. And the last chapter is Call Me Mr. Lucky. And uh, uh, it's this. Here's how I start every day. You all, this is, a, this is a great way to start your day. Tomorrow morning, I hope all of you will start your day this way. When you wake up in the morning, I want you to stick your left foot out from underneath the covers. And I want you to look at your big toe on your left foot. And if you don't see a toe tag, I want you to realize it's going to be a great, great day. It's a very simple thing to do, but it puts your life in perspective. Look at your big toe on your left foot. No toe tag. It's a great day, OK? I then roll over to my wife, Sparky, and I say, call me Mr. Lucky, to which she almost always responds, call me Mrs. Lucky, which comes from a poster in Hanover, New Hampshire, which is lost three-legged dog, has mange, missing right ear, broken tail, recently castrated, and answers to the name Lucky. I haven't been castrated, but I still think I answer to the name uh, Lucky. I then get out of bed, and this voice that used to crank at me, all this negative stuff, heart barely whispers now. And I go in, I, I get ready for the day. If Gordy is not bagging the customers at Kroger, he oftentimes, uh, he oftentimes walks with me. My conversations with him are wonderful. Uh, I oftentimes talk to my youngest son. They're equally of, of value. They're both of wonderful value. They're both very different, but they're wonderful conversations. I come home at night. I get home around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I have to work like I used to. We have dinner together. Gordy goes to bed around 9 o'clock, and uh, Sparky and I have some time together before, uh, before we go to sleep. It's a very simple day. But I think my life is incredibly beautiful. And I think it's beautiful for two fundamental reasons. The first is, what are the chances that these things would come together, these molecules and atoms, and form a create a living human being? Wouldn't we far more likely be some molten rock on some one of the 32 sex trillion objects in this universe someplace else? And instead of that, we're a living, breathing human being on the face of this earth. It's an incredible miracle. We are an impossibility existing in an impossible world in an impossible universe. Why shouldn't we realize that we have just won an incredible lottery by being alive and being on the face of this earth? 
The second reason I believe my life is beautiful is even more inar inarguable than the, than the first. And that is, I believe my life is beautiful because I decided it was beautiful. The second you decide your life is beautiful, it's like any other beautiful possession that you're going to have. You're going to take care of it. You're not going to mess it up. You're not going to mess it up with drugs or excessive alcohol or, or breaking commitments. You're going to take care of it like you do any other beautiful possession. And that decision that your life is beautiful is the fundamental decision of happiness, and it's available to every single person in this room. May your life be full of joy. May it be a life of love and a love of life. And I really have enjoyed uh, being with you all this, this evening. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Enjoy. Thank you. On behalf of the